I'll read the whole chapter. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Here, focusing in on there, the church in Philadelphia and the door of faith that was opened unto them, the door of faith that you need to step through. In verse 7, you see, and to the angel in the church in Philadelphia write, these things say, he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, and no man open, or he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Now, it's interesting to note that that word key is actually only found eight times in the Bible. You can go and turn to Isaiah chapter 22, if you will, specifically referring to the key of David being mentioned. But <clears throat> I figured that that would be something that would be more prevalent in the scriptures. You have in Matthew 16, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. You find in Luke 11, the key of knowledge. In Revelation 1.18, the keys of hell and of death Revelation 9, as well as Revelation 20, there is the key of the bottomless pit. And over in Isaiah chapter 22, beginning in verse 20, you find specifically the key of David mentioned. And it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. And I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle. And I will commit thy government into his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. 
And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, all the vessels of small quantity and the vessels of cups, even unto the vessels of flagons. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in a sure place be removed and cut down and fall. And the burden that was upon it shall be cut off for the Lord hath spoken it. Here regarding the key of David, you see certain things that may connect this man known as Eliakim to Jesus Christ. It talks about how he is the one that openeth the door and no man shut it, and he has shut the door and no man can open it. It talks about being fastened in a sure place, but even then that nail that is fastened shall fall, shall be cut down, and the burden that is upon it shall be cut off. Now this may be referring specifically to a, a prophetic type of Jesus Christ in the last days when he went to the cross, when he was that nail fastened, when all of the keys were placed upon his shoulders and he, he bore that burden, when he was fastened as a nail to that uh, cross, you know, when, when he carried the great wealth of the world on his shoulders and the great loss of it was also uh, associated with him in that time. He could also be grabbing hold of specifically Elkanah when you'll find later on, a few chapters later, he actually stands before Reb Sheka and here's the proclamation that he made regarding the people of Israel. Basically he says, you know, you know, your God shall be as nothing before us. And he blasphemously denounces the Lord God of Israel and puts him down. So this could be just drawing the attention to the fact that he was going to be a great man of prominent thing. Because he was the one that essentially took that message and he proclaimed to Reb Shek to speak in the he speak in the tongue that your your tongue that we can understand and not unto the people. But he wanted to blaspheme the Lord in front of all the people. And then Elkanah there he took that specific message unto the king. He he served as like a mediator in that position. And I'm sure there's so much more there that you can grab a hold of and you can look at specifically regarding the key of David and what that would mean. Is this the same as the key of the bottomless pit? Is it the same as the keys of hell and of death? I think there's there's plurality there. There's more than one key associated with this situation. Now we could go and make a thousand different stories and a thousand different sermon illustrations regarding this key, but there's nothing in my understanding right now that is crystal clear. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to accept it as it is and just wait for more revelation to come. The best part about this key, if you go back to Revelation chapter 7, the best part about that key is that he that is holy and he that is true is the one who has it and is the one who uses it. That's the best thing about this key is that it is in the power of Christ and what he does with that key is he takes it, he uses it, and he opens a door that no man shutteth. And he opens that door and leaves it open and it is there for the purpose of us having access to. If you were to refer to Jesus Christ, you find him in John chapter 10, and I'll go there, John chapter 10, referring to himself specifically as the door, as the door. And so here in Revelation, he opened that door that no man can shut, and that door could be typified, it could be an example of Christ himself. In John chapter 10, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were, which he spake unto them. So here Jesus begins in John chapter 10 to expound unto the people, the religious folks in particular, about himself, and what he is in regard to this parable that he is making. He says that there is a door and the shepherd is the only one that would come honestly to that door and enter in that way. The porter opens unto him, accepts him in. The sheep or graciously follow after him because it's his voice that they recognize. 
And here Jesus Christ, with the confusion that sets in because of his parable, begins to expound in verse 7. He says, Then Jesus said unto them again, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, okay, I am the door of the sheep. Okay, he talks about a shepherd entering in through the door. And now you would think that maybe Jesus Christ was that shepherd in the parable, but he says, no. In fact, I am the door. He says in verse 8, all that ever come before me are thieves and robbers. So there is only one door here. But the sheep did not hear them. In other words, the saved, the believers, the ones that are yoked up with the shepherd, belonging unto the shepherd, did not hear the thieves and the robbers. Again, Jesus says in verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So here Jesus Christ describes himself as the door. And this door is one that offers salvation. It also offers abundant living. It says that right there in verse 9. It says, if any man enter in, so if you enter into Christ, he shall be saved. But it doesn't just end there. It says, and shall, on top of being saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. And this is a reciprocal thing. It says that if any man enter in, he shall be saved. That's a once for all salvation. That's it. That's settled. That's established. But after that, it says, and shall go in and out. This is a reciprocating thing. In other words, every day the saved should enter in through the door and enter out through the door and go find pasture and enter in through the door and enter out through the door. What do you find out there? Well, you find the world. Well, you find, well, you find things. You find people. You find different opportunities. But it's describing a reciprocating relationship in that once you enter in, you're saved. But after that, the responsibility is to continue to use that door. That door is Christ. Continue to come to him. Enter in. Find his rest only that you can go back out through the door. Enter in, enter out. This is the description of the Christian life. We're not just to go through the door, enter in once, and then stay there forever. No, we're to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're to go into the world and take care of our families. We're to go into the world and be a blessing unto others and, and live our lives and have a job. There's all sorts of things that we can do in the power of God, but first we have to enter in. And not only that, often we have to enter into that same door to be with the Savior. In John chapter 10, it continues and says in verse 10, The thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and then they might have it more abundantly. And now Jesus is going to continue this parable and now he's going to describe himself as the shepherd as well. I am the good shepherd, he says. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep, but he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, Seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. Again, I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. Here Jesus brings himself in contrast to the thief. And what does the thief do? It kills, steals, destroys. In contrast, Jesus Christ, he gives... He gives life, and he also doesn't destroy, but he builds up and repairs. God here says, he says, I give. What does he give? The open door. He gives the, the sheep life. He gives them strength. He also cares for the sheep. He also knows the sheep. All that is contained within that passage where Jesus Christ describes himself first as the door, but also the sheep that, or the shepherd that leadeth to the door. By extension, his shepherds would do the same work that he does. Bring people to the door. Bring people to the door that, so that they can enter in. When they enter in, what are they? They're saved. The Bible continues and says regarding Jesus Christ and how he is known of his sheep. Verse 22, the religious obviously aren't known, nor do they know the shepherd nor the door. In verse 22 it says, and it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, how long dost thou make us to doubt if thou be the Christ? Tell us plainly. The reality is, is that Jesus Christ had already explained it time and time and time and time again. And that's exactly what he says in verse 25. He said plainly, I'm in the, I'm the Christ. And in verse 25, Jesus answered them and said, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. 
So he told them verbally that yes, he was the Christ. Plain as day, yet they did not hear. Why? Because they did not believe. The sheep believed, but these religious folks did not. And why? Because verse 27 is clear. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. This is the relationship that Christ has with his own sheep. Then when they heard this, when he said, I've already told you plainly, they heard it again, and they realized that, yes, he is actually affirming the fact that he is the Christ, that he is the Son of God. And in verse 33, the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself equal with God. Jesus' response in verse 36 is, Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. And in verse 37 he said, If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. The works here that are done by Jesus Christ are the same works that we're to do while we're in Christ. Christ again promises life, but not only life as in salvation, he promises a more abundant life, a more full life. And that's even in this life that we are living today. But the way that we get hold of that life isn't just to receive salvation and the gifts of the Spirit once. No, it's to always and reciprocal and, and often enter in through that same door, the open door that God has provided for all of us in order that we could get recharged, in order that we could get strengthened, in order that we could get edified. Just spend time with the Savior. And this is what Christ is encouraging to these people. Yeah, he said, in contrast to both types that are hearing him, he said, I am the shepherd, I am the door, I am the leader of the sheep. And yet one group looked at it as some sort of rebellious stance against God. The other looked at it and said, no, this is just Christ as the shepherd bringing us to the true door that's been provided by God, the open door, that we could have fellowship and we could go in and go out and find pasture from that standpoint. Christians need to enter in through that door often. Once you've entered in once, you're saved. That's great. Go in, go out, be led of him always because that is the way that the door has been opened and that is the opportunity that has been provided by it. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 8 talks about who is qualified to receive such a blessing and such a gift and such an opportunity. These in Philadelphia, he says of them in verse 8, Revelation 3 verse 8, I know thy works, okay? He understood their works and this is an interesting church because you're not going to find anything negative to say about them. God here is just encouraging this church and strengthening this church and trying to build them up where they're at. And what he's done with the church that is known of their works and their works don't have a negative connotation associated with them is he has given them an open door, more open door, an opportunity to get involved in more things. This specific church and us as individuals need to have the same characteristics here. In verse 8 he says, I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door that no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. So this is the reason why God felt it me to provide for them this open door. They have a little strength, they have kept the word, and they have not denied his name. Let's model after these of Philadelphia. In verse 9, you'll find again, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, while well, make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. This is the little strength. This is them picturing the little strength that they have. This is the same synagogue of Satan that back in chapter 2 and verse 9 was, was sending the church in Ephesus into poverty. They were sending them through tribulation. They were blaspheming. They were, they were fighting with them. They were always battling with that church. And that church we know is a strong church unto battle. But this church here in Revelation chapter 3 in Philadelphia, it almost seems like they're a little bit more passive. They have the synagogue there, and they're doing the same things, no doubt, but they're in a, a state of, of being pressed down. And I say that because God offers the, the contrast in that if they are to take the little strength that they have and persevere and push through the poverty and push through the tribulation and take the, the pressing down and take the demeaning and take the beating and take the suffering from the synagogue, the tables in time will turn. 
Hold on to that little strength that you have. Hang in there because your time is coming. I hear God challenging those at Philadelphia. You need to believe by faith that even though now you don't see it, even though now you see the synagogue of Satan, those that say they are Jews but are not in delight, you see them in a great position of power, don't worry, your time is coming when they will come by the hand of God and worship before the feet of this particular church. The tables are going to turn. Yeah, you're being oppressed right now. Yeah, you're being beaten. Yeah, you're being put down. Yeah, you're seemingly being defeated. But God noticed that this church has a little strength left. And that strength is going to be what allows them to persevere, get to the next stage where their time comes. And finally, the tables have turned. And those that are oppressing them are the ones that end up having to worship before their feet. The word of patience. The Bible says they have kept the word. The wolves of Philadelphia have kept the word. In verse 10 it says, Behold, um, sorry, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. If you go to 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2, you're going to find in 2 Peter, sorry, chapter 1 and verse 2, 2 Peter 1 and verse 2, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given to us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us unto faith and virtue. So the word of his patience is what Peter's talking about right now. His word has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. There is nothing that we are missing in the revelation of God. Peter himself, seeing the great transfiguration of Christ, said that we have a more sure word of prophecy. We have something better than visions. And God gave this to us and allows for us to grow in his divine power unto what's called glory and virtue. Verse 4, whereby, so by the same word, are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. So this is again patience being one of the exemplary virtues that's being added to somebody with all diligence. And the Bible says in verse 8, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here, there's the exhortation again given to continue in that works. And that's what he said unto the Philadelphian church. I believe that's what Peter is writing about here. He says, hey, you've kept the word of my patience. Hey, you have all things that will allow you to grow and be partakers of the divine nature. You can grow in glory and virtue. You can add to the faith that you have because you entered in through the door. You can enter in and you can come back out again. Jesus said, I'm the word of life, right? He said, in the beginning was the word and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So if we're going to enter into the door to be with Jesus Christ, we have to enter in through this door. And it is this door that the Bible is saying of itself that allows us to grow in these things. If these particular things are in you and abound, they will make you that you should neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of Christ that you have gained thereby. So if you were to look down in verse 9, the exact opposite is given. It says, but he that lacketh these things, so if you're lacking the scriptures that will add to you these particular forms of virtue, these particular characteristics of the divine nature. If he, he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So you become blind to this thing. The great part of the church of Philadelphia was that they were constantly entering back in through the door that Christ opened up for them. Because he did it, his, their vision became clear. The ones that lack the training, lack the discipline, lack the knowledge that the scriptures give become blind. Their vision gets 
obscure, their vision gets blurry, and they don't grow. And eventually, the Bible says, they have forgotten that they were once purged from their old sins. In other words, it can get to the point where your mind is just so blank and blurry, you don't even, you don't even understand the first principles of living a Christian life. You've forgotten, you've put away from, you've went far from you the fact that you're even saved to begin with. Some people forget those things. I've, I've actually heard of people, uh, I've had friends of friends who, who kind of forgot that they were even saved until they had the gospel will preach to them, and they're like, yeah, yeah, I believe that many years ago, but they've gotten so far from it, they became blinded in their own lifestyle, and their own living, and their own ways, and they forgot even the fact that they were saved. Like, glory to God that somebody can believe at a very young age, and then can call upon the Lord for salvation, and get so bad that they have to be reminded that they were even saved, just like I have to be reminded of my own birthday sometimes. It, it, would to God it wouldn't happen among believers, and they wouldn't forget their spiritual birthday happened, but it's out there. But glory to God, this church had held on. They have works and also they have vision. So what I believe is being emphasized here on that particular church is the fact that they have an open door before them. And it's because they have kept the word of the patience. And we need to keep the word of his patience. Always be entering into that door. Always be getting more revelation from the scriptures so that our, our eyes stay clear. We'll constantly have a vision for the next things to come. And we have to take each step along the way by faith. Notice how even in 2 Peter there, it says, add to your faith. It's always the starting point of any area of growth, of any kind of movement, of any kind of step in the right direction towards God. It's first by faith. And even with Soundwords Baptist Church, I can remember the moment when I was given the call to come and preach. I, I knew that there was an open door before me, but I knew that that time wouldn't last forever. That opportunity wouldn't be forever. I had to step through that door as fast as I could. Now, I went about the right, the right mode and the right way, and I asked my pastor, and I prayed about it, and I sought godly counsel. But that doesn't mean that I took for granted the fact that that opportunity, that door would be open forever. And it was interesting because I had no clear vision of what would happen afterwards, after me saying yes, after me coming that first time. But once I stepped through that door by faith, suddenly my eyes became clearer and I could see what was before me. And every step of the way, I found the same things have happened. Whenever we, as a church, have had to make a great step, a great leap of faith, it seems unclear, it seems uncertain, it seems scary, until you take that step of faith and suddenly your vision is clear. I found found the same thing with uh, going on the mission trip. I didn't, I didn't think about what would happen when I go there. In fact, there was perhaps anxiety and worry and cares about the whole situation. But when I stepped out in faith and said, yes, I'll go, like I told last week, we saw the opportunities just open up to where I could go because I stepped out by faith and I was given the provision. And then once I got there, the vision became clear. What I saw when my boots were on the ground were clear. This is the reason why God brought me here. This is the purpose why I had come to this spot. And my vision has grown even more in this area of foreign missions and getting out there and doing week long, bi week, like two week long, however long mission trips to certain places. We could even go for weekends just down to somewhere like the Native Reserve. The vision is clear, but it's because God put before us an open door, because we have a little strength, because we have just enough to get through and to hang in there. And because we have kept the word of his patience, he continues to leave that door open for us. No man's going to shut it. The only one's going to shut it is God. And if we were to turn from keeping strength, turn from keeping his word, then sure as anything, he can shut that door upon us, right? Verse, uh, the next one is that we have not denied his name. Now, <clears throat> the first thing actually I want to notice is that if you look at verse 10 in 2 Peter, it says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. So God has called, he has appointed us to a specific task. And it says, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. And that's what I mean where we have to stay diligent in the things that God has given to us. In the open doors that he has given us, we need to step in by faith. And as he calls, we answer yes. And if we do those things, if we continue in those things, if we grow in those things, we shall never fall. And he uses the example as entering in. Verse 11 says, For so an entrance shall be ministered 
unto you abundantly to the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And this is the entrance that I was talking about where we have opportunity to step through the door. We can go to where Christ is. We can meet with Christ. And he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. Didn't God give us access to the Holy of Holies? Opportunity to step before his throne of grace? We can enter in abundantly into that everlasting kingdom to the purpose that we would bring the strength that we get down here upon this earth. Verse 12 says, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. And this is my job up here, is to constantly be reminding you things of, that you already knew. Constantly be pointing us back to things that we already knew. Because if we're reminded of these things, then we don't have worries about whether or not we will fall in these matters. If you keep the word of patience, you won't need the trial of patience. And that's what it talks about if you were to go back to Revelation chapter 3. If we're to keep the word of patience, then we will not need the trial of patience. And that's what it says in the second part. It says, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, in verse 10, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to them that dwell upon the earth. See, the thing is, is that if you're keeping the word in you, if you're learning things from scriptures, if you're allowing yourself to be rebuked before you even get in trouble, if you're patiently enduring the, 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 the uh, correction that the scriptures give you, and then you're quickly repenting when you are corrected and when you are chastened, then you don't need the trial, or at least you won't need as much of the trial, to grow on to the next things, the next steps in your life. One thing that I often challenge people is to, to pray that prayer. You know, Lord, help me in the area of patience. And that's a scary prayer to pray because that means you're going to go through some things. You're going to go through some trials. You're going to go through a time of waiting and suffering. But if we're to just spend our lives growing in the things of God, reading the Bible, understanding the Bible and the scriptures correct us, then we need less of those trying times. And here the particular church in Philadelphia was, was told that they would be kept from that hour of temptation, the trial that will come upon the whole world. They would be free from it because they have kept the word of the patience and next they have not denied thy name. Verse 11 says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown from him. And it is the great I, it is the great I am that is coming quickly. And this group has not denied his name. They have rightly put Christ as the head. They have taken him and essentially wore him as a crown, not denying his name, proclaiming his name, being marked as one of his own. And this is another reason why the door has been opened, because they wear Christ proudly upon their breast. They openly proclaim Christ. He is that crown upon their very heads. And verse 12 says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. But before that it says, Behold, I come quickly. And he says, that, Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown from them. And this group has grabbed a hold of the crown that is Jesus, and they're not letting it go. Hold fast to those things. And if you're to overcome it, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from God, and I will write upon him my new name. This is a great thing because he just finished saying that there's a door that is open and no man shut it. He just said that of himself back in John chapter 10, that he is that door, and we are to enter in once be saved, and then go in and then go out, and then go in and then go out. But this is promising, and this is another thing that the church and us have to accept by faith, is that there is coming a day when we won't have to go in and to go out anymore. We won't have to leave the very presence of God. He says, him that overcometh, and they do that by faith, right? Will I make a pillar in the temple of my God? In other words, you're established. You're sure. You are standing in the temple, and the promise here is that he shall no more go out. You shall no more step out into the world. You will no more have to leave his presence. You will be there forever. You will go no more out. 
You will no more have to step out and walk by faith in this world. But that's not the time that we have there. That's a time that's promised, and we can be there essentially day by day by day. Every time we enter in that door, we can come into God's presence and just, just bask in the warmth. Just be in the glow. Just be in that opportunity in our prayer closet where we're with God alone. But ultimately, we have to leave. We have to go. We have things to do. But there is coming a day, and we can accept that by faith, when the newness of it all will be complete. As the Bible says, all things are become new, when finally we'll put off this sinful flesh, and we will be with Christ forever. And the Bible says, he shall no more go out. And that's a promise, not just to this church, but to all of us. What a great blessing will it be to know and finally see the fullness of the promise that we shall be changed in a moment of a twinkling eye, and we shall be like him. And these that have these traits of Philadelphia, that have a little bit of strength that they're willing to give unto God, that have kept the word of his patience and have been through some things and have withstood some things and have long suffered through some things and come out on top because of the strength that God gives above and beyond the little that we give unto him, and we have not denied his name. If we're to take those traits, we have the same promises available to us, that we will be established one day. Everything will come our way. We will not be no longer pushed down. We won't be beaten by the synagogue of Satan and other things that are trying to thwart us and to defeat us and to destroy us and to make us depressed and sad and weak and all those things. No, we will overcome and it will no longer be our responsibility to go out and to take this message because we won't have faith. We won't need faith at that time when we're standing literally pillared in the temple of God with him, established in him, and enjoying the newness that is there. I love this church. I love the opportunity that they've been given. They have an open door. And if we're walking in the same types of characteristics that they are, God's going to just keep giving us open doors, more opportunities to get involved in his ministry, more opportunities to be a blessing to people, more opportunities to see people saved, more opportunities to grow personally and as a church. And it's only because first you step through the door by faith. You get clear vision from God and then you go back out. And this is what each and every one of us need to do each and every day. Go before God. Step through the door. Allow the shepherd to guide you and to give you marching orders for that day and then to go and find pasture and to come back in and do the same thing over and over again. Constantly be getting more strength from God. Constantly getting more of the word from God. Constantly growing in the patience. As we look in faith for a hope that is set before us, we will not give up. We will not quit on the race that is set before us, but we will continue to hold high his banner, to uphold his name, and to not wear it with any type of shame. We be unashamed before him at his coming. And that's something that the church in Philadelphia, right? And that's something that can uh, be received also by, as it says in verse 13, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Thank you, Father, for this day. I thank you, God, that I do have a little strength today. And I pray, God, that I could uh, 